Hello, everybody. Welcome back to game-based learning in the world language classroom, the why, what, and how. I'm on section three of my book, The How. I'm teaching you how to do specific games in your class. My name is Madame Sensei. I teach Spanish, French, and Japanese to high schoolers out here in the beautiful but rainy Pacific Northwest. And if you want to talk to me about these games, help me tweak them, help me come up with more games, you can find me on the Roxem Teachers site, the Duolingo Educators Network, the Minecraft Education Ambassadors, or the Minecraft Teachers Lounge, or at studio-nemo.com. Love to collaborate with people. We're on chapter 16 of my book, How to Play Jenga to Practice Most Anything. We were talking about Battleship. Now we're going to do Jenga. Jenga is gamification because we're taking a game and using it for the drill and kill we need to do. So um, I purchased seven Jenga sets using PTSA money. I wrote a grant. Um, you could also write a grant for your um, union. They probably have grants. And uh, they weren't that expensive, so uh, PTSA was very happy to buy them for me. And uh, what you need is you need several different colors, Sharpies, and you need the Jenga sets, okay? Um, in the Duolingo Educators Network, we were talking about this, and my colleague Amy H. had the brilliant idea of don't write sentences on the Jenga, write numbers, because then you can reuse them for other things. And that was just absolutely golden, because I can use, I can break out the Jenga whenever uh, I need to drill and kill anything. So I decided that 15 sentences was about the right number. It was a pretty decent number. It would give me not too many, not too few, a uh, good chance for repetition, not too repetitious. All right, there's 54 of these blocks in the set. So numbering it 1 through 15 gives you about three chances to get each one of them. All right, now this next thing I did was I've got six table groups and I bought seven uh, Jenga sets so that I could keep my my group's a little smaller, all right? I took seven Sharpies of different colors. This was absolutely crucial because you know that they're gonna fall and the pieces are gonna get strewn all over the room. So by saying, oh, the set number one is all the brown Sharpie, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up to 15. Set number four is the orange. Okay, so as the pieces get spread across the room, you know, somebody's tower falls and it goes really far away it's easy to see which group those numbers belong to. Much easier if that if two groups fall at the same time. All right, so now you need to pick 15 sentences or words that you want the students to work on. And you have a choice here, okay? You can either have the students translate into the target language, in which case I really suggest you say you give it in English, and have them translate into the target language. That requires them to think a bit more. So, you know, when I'm teaching the students how to make crepes and we're, we're learning the phrases before, sometimes I'll say, okay, tell me how, you know, sentence number five, give me three eggs, and they have to say it en français, okay? Um, or you could give them some kind of open-ended question. This is what I really like to do, um, you know, uh, ¿Qué te gusta hacer cuando llueve? What do you uh, like to do when uh, it's raining? Okay, some open-ended question that they have to ask somebody else at their desk. That's actually my favorite thing to do. Or your 15 things can be 15 different commands. Okay, if your students are stuck in the silent period and um, they just aren't confident talking aloud or you want them to understand the classroom commands or you just need them to work on some verb forms, give them some action that they have to do. So the students have to pull the Django thing and then they have to pantomime the action and uh, it gets really silly. So print your 15 sentences or questions or whatever you've got, print them on cardstock because that way you can put it away and then you can easily pull it out for next time. I find um, just regular paper kind of gets crumpled a little bit. So cardstock it makes it, it it makes it look a little he more hefty. It is more hefty, but you know the students aren't gonna like break it at all because they know it's important. Um, and then I make one cardstock copy uh, for each Jenga set, so I'll I'll run to the copy machine and make seven copies. And at the same time, I also project these on the board. Okay, so in a pinch, my lesson has gone south. The students just are 
crawling off the walls or they're yawning and I'm like oh my god I need something new in a pinch I just run up to the board and I write down 15 sentences and I pass out the Jenga sets and sometimes the students in the back kind of have to move around or crane their neck or something to see the board because students in the foreground are in weird positions trying not to let their tower topple but it's so active everybody loves it and it's fine and you can have the students help you um, make the sentences if that's the case if you have to do this on the fly so you don't absolutely have to have this but I like to have it okay so this one is an example of this is very early in French 1 um, and I just want them to recognize the top verbs by frequency and not only that but you know as long as they're translating it I want them to demonstrate that they know where to look in the room for the scaffolding oh say how to get the circumflex on top of the e while typing okay um use it in a sentence um oh to say or to tell ask how do you say because they say should be able to say como diton and they should be able to recognize that dir is the same as the d in como diton um ask can i go like can i go to the bathroom um spell it because they always leave out an l and then they this one they just conjugates to il faut that's all they need to know right now I'll give a trick to remember. So that's the kind of stuff I did there. And then these are more open-ended questions. This was, we were working on clothing and, um, uh, did you wear a red t-shirt this week? Um, um, how many students in the classroom are wearing black t-shirts? Um, you know, just open-ended questions. Oh, this was a fun one. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this, we were working on clothes here too. Okay. And I gave them the rules. If you speak any English, you have to take a second block. We'll get to that in a second. When you pull out a block, run to the clothing stack and find the clothes. I have a bunch of ugly, ugly clothes that my mother, the shopaholic buys for my kids and my kids don't like them. And I'm like, Oh, we're not going to donate this. I'm going to take it to the classroom. So the students have to run to the clothing stack and find the article of clothing and put it on okay but if there's none of the clothing in the clothing stack then they have to go back to their table and take another block and there was a race between all the different groups and you know um they weren't allowed to knock over everybody else's jengas on their way over there so this was what i had on the board and in front of them on the cardstock some scaffolds for how to scream at each other go quickly hurry up that's not right um, yeah, so there's not any more whatever. Be careful. Oh, no, you made it fall. Okay, and then these were the the clothing that they had to find. That worked really well. That was fun. All right, so here's the actual rules, okay? Get the students into groups, of course, and I find that groups of four are about perfect. Six, which I sometimes have to do because of if I have a class with 36 students, as I do this year, I have to do six. Um, six, I find it's a bit too passive as, as the students are waiting for their turn to come around again. So ideally four. Okay, so one student's going to pull out a block and then they're going to read the number on the block and make them read it in the target language. The number is going to correspond to a number on the cardstock or, or on the board. Okay, and then um, you decide if the student's going to answer the question or if the student's going to ask the question to the person on his left or the person on his right or whatever. Um, you could do it that way if you want. Or, hey, as it turns out, I just kind of let each table decide what they're, if they're going to answer it themselves or if they're going to ask the person next to him. If the student gets the question wrong, he has to pull a second block out. Nobody wants to pull two blocks because there's more of a chance of toppling the tower. So they really want to get it right. My absolute favorite moment of this, um, we were working on um, classrooms, classes, the students were describing their school schedule and um, I was eavesdropping on the students, of course, which I'll talk about in a moment, but there was a student who's, he wasn't the best student in the class. He was struggling. Uh, he was a fun kid. He was a good kid, but he was struggling, you know, and he, he got asked the question about what's your hardest class and why. And he really wanted to say the chemistry class and um, why it was hard and how he didn't like the teacher and blah, 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 blah. And it, I also say everything we say in, 
in French class stays in French class. So you can talk about all your teachers as long as you're describing them grammatically, and I'm okay, and I will never tell them. But at any rate, um, he wanted to say something. And um, he could have. I could see the wheels turning in his head. He couldn't remember the word for chemistry, and he couldn't remember a couple of the other words. And the wheels were turning in his head. And normally, at that point, a student would say, oh, okay, I'm just going to talk about my English class because I know how to say English class, you know, or I know how to say French class, you know, but he insisted, he kept pushing himself to describe his chemistry class. And when he took out his second block, because the kids at the table had heard him speak English and he had to take a second block, he said, that was worth it. Okay. I was so proud of him. He said that was worth it in English. And I was like, okay, fine. You get a pass on that because I was so proud of him for sticking with it and his, his, perseverance and it it just made me really happy and made me feel like yeah I'm doing the right thing oh sorry we're over 10 minutes I'm gonna finish up really quick all right so when your students are doing this you sit in the middle of the room don't this is not the time to be grading papers this is not the time to be answering your emails you sit in the middle of the room and you are eavesdropping on all your student stuff so you could hear things like that um, that's, see, this is a formative assessment. Okay. You want to hear how your students are doing. You walk around, you comment on their towers in the target language. Um, you give them words of encouragement in the target language, but this is, this is, you're listening to your students do this. Okay. So sorry, I went over 10 minutes in our next episode. We're going to talk about physical games, games to get your students up and moving around. Uh, I know Jenga is pretty physical, but these are more physical games, so hope to see you there.